Genesis 3, 1 to 24. As a text, Genesis 3 must be read with caution because it contains lots of details that would pique our modern interests, but are never elaborated on by the author. Therefore, we must be wary of making conjectures over those details that the author has chosen not to clarify with conclusive explanations. Instead, in keeping with faithful biblical interpretation principles, we must primarily focus on ascertaining the meaning of this text from what is clearest in the original text and its context, and from what the author and the original audience would have naturally understood. Let's keep that in mind as we read the text. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Much against our modern connotations of the serpent to Satan, nowhere in this verse or the rest of the text is that conjecture ever made. In fact, the serpent is here simply referred to as another beast of the field created by God, without any indication in the context that this beast represents some other evil being. Neither should we associate any negative or evil connotations to the fact that the serpent was craftier than the other beasts. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Although seemingly innocent and inquisitive, this question deliberately misconstrues God's command to Adam and Eve, luring Eve into making an explanation. Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The remark is often made that Eve's explanation differs from God's exact commandment, see Genesis 2, 16-17. But the author never makes much of this fact in the rest of the narrative. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent wasn't totally incorrect in his assessment of what would happen if they disobeyed God. They don't immediately die, as Adam went on to live to be 930 years old, see Genesis 5.5. And God himself remarks at the end of this chapter, verse 22, that humanity has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. And so, the deception in the serpent's words did not rest on the immediate eventualities of their disobedience, but on whether the consequences were going to be far less severe than he had led them to think, and that the benefits far more desirable than he led them to believe. Verse 6. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. It's important we note two observations here, without necessarily making conjectures beyond the parameters of the text. First, there needed not to be anything inherently evil or sinful about this tree and its fruit, or in its appearance or ability, for God to forbid Adam and Eve from eating it. In fact, we know from Genesis 1 that everything God created, which included this tree, was very good. Second, even though Eve is the one who primarily interacts with the serpent, the grammar of the original text, in verbs and pronouns, is plural throughout this section, implicating them both in this act of disobedience. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, 
and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Both of the words for man and you in this verse are singular in the original language, indicating that Adam was the primary representative of the husband and wife counterpartnership, which is why God came searching for him first, considering what had happened. Verse 10. And he, Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He, God, said, in response, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Whereas before the serpent was more crafty than the other beasts, it is now more cursed and viewed with contempt, as depicted by its slithering on its belly and eating dust for its part in deceiving Eve. Verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Though this verse has traditionally been interpreted as foreshadowing the gospel, predicting Satan's ultimate defeat through a future descendant of Eve, the grammar in the original language fails to support this interpretation conclusively. For example, the text is clear that it's the offspring of both the woman and the serpent who would engage in this ongoing conflict. If Satan is the serpent, then it would be his offspring, and not necessarily himself, who would be defeated by the offspring of the woman, an unprofitable debate to even consider. Instead, by considering what the author and the original audience would have naturally understood, it's likely that what is in view by this verse is the ongoing hostility that will exist between humanity and snakes with both sides capable of inflicting mortal strikes to each other's vulnerable places. Verse 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Both in its grammar and syntax, the first part of this verse refers to both the anxiety and pains that a woman will bear through the entire process of conceiving and birthing children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The effect of Adam's disobedience is brought to bear on the ground, making it harder to produce the nourishment humanity needs from it. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. 
revealing God's kindness and grace towards them despite their disobedience. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In the Old Testament, the cherubim are supernatural creatures whose function is to guard the presence of God. And so, by placing them to guard against entry into the garden, God cemented the ultimate consequence of the fall, that Adam and Eve had lost access to the presence of God in which they were created to dwell. So, oh, good morning to you. There we go, there we go, you are alive. Uh, you've been enjoying that reading so much that uh, now you need to actually tune into uh, my deep voice and so uh, you're welcome. Um, but uh, anyway, I don't know if I've ever actually uh, uh, told the story uh, before but, uh, of my near drowning experience. And so it was on matric holiday and we were down at Balito with, uh, uh, I was down at Balito with a group of friends and uh, one of them had actually a girlfriend who was uh, in Umschlanga and so we decided, and so she was there with her friends and so we decided one day that we were going to go there and spend the day with them at the beach. Uh, at the beach. And so when we arrived there, the weather wasn't partic uh, particularly great and so the waters were a bit choppy uh, as, as well and so when we found the girls at the beach, they warned us of the strong currents. But being tough guys, uh, right, and also needing to impress the ladies, and so myself and a friend decided that we would be the ones who would brave the waters. And so we got jumped in, got in, and uh, caught a few waves and having lots of fun, but didn't actually notice and realize um, uh, how farther and farther we are actually getting from the beach. I just remember at one point thinking to myself, sure, I've never been this far from the shore before, huh? And so they decided, no, let me swim back. And so I swam a little bit back, uh, backwards, then looked up again, and then I, I could have sworn that I, I hadn't gone anyway. And so I decided, let me swim a bit harder, and then looked back, and this time I was sure that I'd gone backwards. And that's when I realized actually what was happening, that the current was actually dragging me, uh, uh, dragging me out. Now, I'm a fairly decent swimmer, uh, uh, right? And so I haven't won a medal at the Olympics, but hey, I reckon that huh, I could have uh, done something if I'd qu uh, qualified. And so I had nothing to worry though, uh, about. But then when I started feeling getting sat down, I'm like, sure, panicking. And I started to hear some of my friends uh, uh, still ashore and the girls yelling for me to get back. So they kind of trying to swim very hard. Couldn't spot my friend who was in the water with me. And so out of panic and desperate to try to survive, it became one thing. One thing I just had one thing on my mind. Better get out of here as I'm racing um, uh, way th uh, through. And so in and out of the water, I can barely see the shore. I'm taking in water, more, more water than I would have liked. And with every stroke, I just am getting tired and tired. And that's when it sunk and the, uh, the uh, thought entered my mind for the first time and I can vividly remember when I had the thought, maybe this is the day I die. Like, kid you not, I, to this day, I get the chills when I think about how actually uh, sobering that thought really was. Now, I don't know how I survived through the whole experience. My friends afterwards told me that from their vantage point, they started seeing how I, I caught one wave after the other that brought me closer to the shore. For me, I was just swimming as hard as I could to try to save my life until out of the blue, I felt the sand beneath my feet. And then they ran in and dragged me out. And so exhausted and bloated and cold as they gathered around me, I had this one thought on repeat resounding in my mind. And it was, I wish I had listened when they told me not to get in. Have you ever had that regret in your life before? I wish I had listened. I wish I had listened when they told me, or 
warn me about making that investment or bringing that person into the business. I wish I had listened when my friends raised concern about me dating or marrying that person. I wish I had listened when they begged me not to go on that trip. I wish I'd listened when they told me not to use that stuff or stop using it. I wish I had listened when my work colleague told me that I was flirting too much with that other colleague. I wish I had listened when they were advising me to start exercising and eat healthy. I wish I had listened when I was warned about never visiting that website. That's one of the worst regrets we feel in our lives, right? When knowing that we could have avoided all of the pain, frustration, and even disaster that ensued had we listened all along. Had we listened all along. And when you go through something like that in your life and you come out on the other side and are able to tell the story, we often feel regretful, right? That we did not listen or chosen what was obvious and right before us. Now, the story of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 is a story of such regret where Adam and Eve gambled away, gambled away what they wish they hadn't by not listening to God, by not listening to God. And so we'll spend the next three weeks in Genesis 3 today looking at what happened at the fall and why. And then over the next two weeks, we are going to unpack and explore its consequences on the woman and the man and in their counter-partnership with one another. Wish I had listened. And they wish they had listened to what God had said to them. Now, as the reading has already uh, hinted at, uh, Genesis chapter 3, full of all sorts of detail that can actually be tantalizing for us to actually explore. And yet, if we explore that, we cannot arrive at any conclusive interpretation in the author's silence. And so what must we do? We must actually focus on actually trying to understand and interpret from, uh, interpret from what would have been obvious and naturally understood from the author and the original context, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and the original audience. That's where we must place our focus on and try to devise what is happening in this, chap- uh, uh, in this chapter. And so critical to our understanding of Genesis 3 is actually verses 8 to 11. Because what happens in verses 8 to 11, it is when we see God enter the narrative, uh, uh, narrative in that story. Now, I don't know if you know, but God is kind of a big deal in the Bible, right? And so whenever we actually encounter him in it, we ought to actually perk up and actually, and actually listen to actually what will, uh, goes on. And so verses 8 to 11, that's when we see God enter into the story and he makes a concluding statement of what the issue is, the main issue actually is in Genesis chapter 3, and he makes this conclu- uh, uh, conclusive statement through his questioning of Adam. And so look at verse 11. Here's what God says to, uh, to Adam. He said, who told you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat. Whenever I teach biblical interpretation, uh, uh, how to interpret the Bible, I always say, never take the questions that you find in the Bible as being rhetorical, especially when they are from God. You should always seek to try to answer them because they will lead you to actually understand or see what might be at the heart of a particular text. And so in verse 11, God is asking Adam, 
who told you? Implying, I didn't tell you. So who told you? Who told you that you were naked? Answer, no one told me, God. I just realized it. Oh, so have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Answer, yes. God, I have eaten of the tree which you commanded me not to eat. And so God's line of questioning is actually exposing and highlighting to us what is the main issue going on in the sticks. And it is that Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve chose to eat of the tree that God had told them not to eat. That's the main issue. Why and how for the moment isn't the focus. What's the focus is that by their actions, they chose not to listen to God. They chose not to listen to God. Now, as already uh, 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 we saw in the reading, made uh, uh, this important observation that there needed not to be anything inherently evil or bad about this tree and its fruit. In fact, from the rest of the Genesis con- uh, context, we can actually conclude the, oppos- uh, the opposite. Uh, opposite. Now, why? why the reason that observation is so important for us is because in our functional understanding of the fall, uh, of the fall we may perhaps tend to war, uh, towards thinking that what Adam and Eve did that was wrong was to eat from a bad tree and thereby clouding the seriousness of what they are actually guilty of before, uh, before God by actually making the tree the problem. And so, and so if there was nothing inherently wrong about that tree, why was it unfit for consumption? Why could they not have eaten from that tree? Why was this tree out of bounds? And in fact, what made this tree out of bounds? The word of God. That's what made it out of bounds. God said, do not eat of it. That's why it was out of bounds and could not be eaten of because God said, do not eat of this tree. And it is what made it out of bounds and was unfit for consumption. And so what are we seeing? We're actually seeing that Adam and Eve refused to listen to the word of God. That's what was at the heart of their rebellious sin, that they refused to listen to the word of God. Of God, and that's what's at the core of Genesis chapter 3 and is at the core of the doctrine of original sin the refusal to listen to the word of God. Uh, of God. And what then happened as they refused to listen to the word of God, it cost them dearly, cost them dear, uh, dearly in their la- lives, in what they went on and lost. And so, what did they lose? Yes, what they lost. Number one, they lost intimacy with God. And so it is God who has to come find them. Why? Because they are hiding from the presence of God after they ate of the tree. Second thing that they lose, they lose transparency before God. God is the one who's confronting, that has to confront them individually. And then what do they do? They blame someone else and then refuse to actually take uh, take accountability or responsibility for their own actions. And then the third thing we see that they lose, they lose vitality from God. Because now, as a result, they're banished from, from the presence of God. And now that they are estranged now from the ultimate source of life, what will happen to them? They will eventually die. They will eventually die. And so then, here's what we need to see in the first part of the main point from the stakes. It is this, when we treat the ultimate source of life with contempt by not listening to his life 
giving words, we will die. We will die. When we treat, when we treat the ultimate source of life with contempt, we will die. But it's not all doom and gloom for them. Because what? We ought to also then see the other side of the point that this text has tried to drive it, that there is another side to it all along, always was another side to it all along. And it is this, that those who listen to the word of God live by it. That those who listen to the word of God live by it, meaning that it is the word of God that will then sustain your life if you would listen to it. Now, to see that from the text, let's deal or address three common objections regarding the fall. Number one, if God knew that Adam and Eve would eat of the tree, why then did he place it there in the first place? Why did he place it there? In the, fir- in the first place, if he knew that they were going to eat of this tree. Now, remember, we've already established in the observation that it need not be anything inherently evil or bad about this tree. God had created a good creation. And so God is entitled to place any good thing he wants in his perfect world, Right? And so what made this tree out of bounds for them wasn't that it was inherently wicked, but it was the word of God about that tree that made it out of of bounds. And so had they listened to the word of God all along, all along around the tree, they would have avoided a fall. And so then here's what we are seeing, and it is so important that we get this, that even in a perfect world, even in a perfect world, humanity always needed to rely on the word of God to know how to best live. Even in a perfect world, we needed to rely on the word of God to know how to best live. Why? Because we're created beings. We need God, our creator, to instruct and guide us on how to experience life and joy and satisfaction that we, uh, that we long for in this life. God has to speak to us about it. And so our problem isn't that we live in an environment where there are good or bad stuff that we ought to avoid. No, our problem is that we are not listening to God about our environment and about those things. That was the problem. And so therefore, what are we seeing? We're seeing that the word of God has to be the truth you must live by. If you want to experience the life that God has in store for you, you need to listen to the word of God. Live by the word of God because it's the truth you need to experience life. Second objection. Why didn't God, by his power, intervene to prevent Adam and Eve from falling just as they were about to? Why didn't he prevent it? Knowing the disaster that would have happened, why didn't he do something about it? But friends, God had done something about it. He had intervened. For what did Adam and Eve, what had God given Adam and Eve that could have prevented the fall? His word. That's what. It was the word of God. That was the power that they needed from God to prevent their fall had they listened to it. Why? Because the word of God empowers our choices in life. It empowers our choices in life. And so think about it this way. Whose word did they ultimately listen to? 
The serpent's words is what they ultimately listened to. And what happened as they listened to the serpent's word? They walked in disobedience. And so do you see that had they actually listened to the word of God, it would have empowered their walk of faithfulness to God. Because the word of God is the power that actually empowers our choices. And so the word of God, what we'll see is that the word of God is the power you need to live by. That's why you've got to treasure the word of God. Because in it is the power you need to make the choices that you need to make in life that will lead you to life. The third objection, where was God when they needed him most? Surely had God been physically present, it could have hurted the fall. But what God would have done? Friends, the answer, but God was present. Where? In his word. With them. In his word. With them. And so listen, let's not miss, don't miss what God expected of them. What did God expect of them? And you see that, you know, it is repeated twice in the sticks. But what God says to Adam, and so first time, uh, uh, the first time we see it, verse 11, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then verse 17, and to Adam, he said, because you have, eat, uh, you have eaten of the tree, uh, of the tree, sorry, verse 7, because you have eaten of the tree, uh, of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. And so what did God expect them to do in that garden? Not to eat of this tree. Why? Because I've commanded you, do not eat of it. And so then what are we seeing? We're seeing that the word of God, by treasuring and abiding in the word of God, it was as good as if they had God there with them, instructing them as to what they should do. And so, and so as you allow the word of God to abide in you, so that's then the presence of God abides with you. With you, as we treasure the word of God, we are then we then experience God Himself guarding us. We then experience the knowledge and the depth of, of understanding of, of the will of God over our lives. And so, the word of God with you, as the word of God abides with you, so that the presence of God lives with you. And so therefore, the word of God makes his presence tangible. It makes his presence tangible in your life as you abide in his word. So God does not need to be physically present for you, for you to know what his will over your life ultimately is. He is with you in his word. It's with you in his word. And so you can experience his presence. And by his word, as it abides with you. Now, friends, we cannot, 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 cannot underestimate the convicting power of Genesis 3 to the original audience who would have been hearing it. And that is the Israelites as they receive it from Moses. Why do I say that? Because where were they when they received the words of, of, of Moses to them? Where were they? Wandering in the wilderness. And so what should have taken them about maybe two weeks, a two-week journey into the promised land, land that turned out to be a 40-year ordeal in the wilderness that then resulted in the death of a whole generation. That's what happened. Now the question is why? Why did that happen to them? Because they too, in their rebellious sin against God, refused to listen to the word of God when God had instructed them, there's the land, 
go and reside in it. You remember that? Right? The story of the 12 spies and how they go into the land, 10 come back and say, whoa, we cannot enter into that land. And Moses, I mean Joshua and Caleb are saying, yes, the land is ready. It is fit for us to enter as God has promised to us. But what do they decide to do? Doubt the word of God. Refuse to listen to the word of God. And what was its consequence? 40 years in the, in the desert so that you would die because you refuse to listen to the word of God. And so they too, as they are receiving this word of Genesis 3, they themselves are a living example. A living example of what happens when you treat the ultimate source of life with contempt by not listening to his word, you die. But Moses is not just sharing this to just deeply condemn them. No, he's sharing it to them so as to prepare the next generation to be a people who will realize that those who listen to the word of God will live by it. They will live by it. And so he wants them to see afresh. He wants them to enjoy afresh the Ten Commandments, Leviticus, Numbers, or even Deuteronomy, where God is giving them now his words. He wants them to see and enjoy in them afresh the love-giving grace of God and realize what Moses himself came to realize, which he later declares in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, and it is this, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's what he wants him to realize. That's the life-giving grace of God that you will live by every word that comes from his mouth. And then you fast forward now into the New Testament. What then do we learn about this word as John opens his gospel to us in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And so John is revealing to us that that living word of God became a person and always was a person in, the, uh, in Jesus Christ and came and dwelt among us. And so through Christ Jesus, we are being offered the life-giving grace of God if we will listen to Christ Jesus. And so when Christ Jesus then enters into the scene, what does he then declare? If not the words that Moses came to believe and ultimately declare to the people of Israel, Matthew 4 verses 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is Christ saying, I am the, uh, the, the word of God. If you want to experience the life giving grace of God, you've got to live your life through me. That's the gospel. That's the invitation of God through Christ Jesus. And so this morning as we end, I want to ask you, will you enjoy? Will you enjoy? Will you take in God's grace as you listen to and live for Jesus Christ? Will you listen to and live for Jesus Christ? Experience the grace of God that is found in Jesus Christ and come to find in Christ Jesus the truth, the power, and the presence of God for your life. Let me pray. Father, again in this service, just humbled, humbled, Humble deeply. I think even in the words, I think of the psalmist, say, who am I that the Lord of all the earth will care to know a man? What is man that you are mindful of it? And so as we come here this morning, we want to say, Lord, sure. Why would you have poured out such grace of our lives? spoken to us your life-giving words that we might live. 
Words that you know, O oh Lord, that we deeply need it. Deeply need it. If we are to experience life as you have intended. And so, Father, humbled by that reality that you will go that far in your foreknowledge, in your grace towards your people. We want to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That our ultimate source of life will not just be found in bread, or finances, possessions, relationships, whatever it is that we're longing for and searching for, for life, that it is found in your life-giving words. And those are not just words written on a page, but again, we remember Christ Jesus saying about these words are written on this page, that these are the words that testify about me. And yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And so, Father, we do not want to be, do not want to be those people that will refuse your life-giving word to us through Christ Jesus. And so for those of us who are then in this room, you're resisting the call of the gospel upon their lives to surrender it all once and for all. At the feet of Jesus, I pray that your spirit that convicts, that illuminates the truth of your word, the truth of Christ and points people to Christ. And Lord, you will lead them home through the grace that can only be found in the gospel of Christ. And then I pray for the rest of us who have received this grace, this gospel, received Christ Jesus as the ultimate source of life. Lord, give us courage to stand firm upon the foundation of Christ and your word. We're living in a time in our society where, Lord, we will feel the pressures of this world calling us to doubt, calling us to disregard, not take as seriously or as literally these words that leads us to find you and you alone. I pray that you will silence those doubts, silence our rebellious hearts and give us the faith we need to be a people that learn by your word that we will find in your word and in Christ Jesus the truth the power and the presence of our God and it is in his name and by the power of his spirit that we pray and all God's people say Amen